really the, the spirit in our nostrils, the breath of nostrils. God breathed into Adam the breath of life or the spirit of life, right? It's not talking about consciousness. It's not talking about your mind. In Ecclesiastes 12, it says uh, when the, the, the body goes back to the grave and it says the spirit goes back to God who gave it. The spirit that goes back to God is, is just a, a phrase poetically saying, you breathe your last breath. And I've been there. I've, I've worked volunteering doing hospice, and I've been there at the, at, the, at the side of a dying person as they are breathing that. You know, and sometimes you got the death rattle, and there's, I mean, it's pretty tragic, but somebody breathing their last breath is what represents death. And, of course, the body going back to the grave. Um, but that, again, I'm going to emphasize that, that is um, spirit. Spirit, and it's something about now. Sometimes the Bible uses the word spirit metaphorically uh, when it says, like, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your spirit, right? Um, that's not talking about, you know, a portion of you, like, you, like there's a part of you. It's talking about, in, in that phrase, it's talking about all that you are, right? Um, and, uh, and then you have the word soul. Soul, nefesh in Hebrew, and suke in Greek, that word. It just means person. It means living being. It means life. And so uh, does your soul go back to God when you die? The answer is no. The soul dies. The soul ceases to exist until the resurrection day in which God gives breath back to the body and that becomes a new soul. I kind of think of it like, uh, like a box. You've got, uh, you got boards, you've got nails. If you put the nails with the boards, you can get a box. If you pull all the nails out of the boards and all you have is boards laying there, where where'd the box go? Well, there is no box because you don't you need to put them together to get the box. And that's the way it is with the soul. The soul doesn't exist until God puts the body and the breath together. And the breath, again, is the spirit. Um, now, I will say there is a passage that has caused some confusion. I'll just read it real quickly here. It's in 1 Thessalonians 5. Uh, it's in verse 23. It says, Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now when it says spirit, soul, and body, he, it's not talking about, somebody say, well, God's a triune, triune being, and so are we. Well, I don't think that we're triune beings. Um, God is not one person. God is three persons. I'm one person, so I, I'm, not, I'm not triune in that sense. Um, but body, soul, and spirit, I think it's just the language of the Bible that would say the body physically, soul spiritually, spirit mentally. May God preserve you completely. That's the whole point of that passage. Let's not read too much into that when we come across phrases like that. Um, but so just, just to be clear, um, the spirit refers to the breath of life. There's no consciousness there. The soul refers to the person. There is consciousness there. The soul doesn't go back to God when you die. Your breath does. And, then, and when it goes back to God, it's just a simply meaning God takes it away from you. Because the righteous and the wicked, whether you're saved or you're lost, your breath goes back to God. Right? You give up the ghost when you die. You breathe your last. And so, anyway, I hope that helped clarify a little bit. There's a lot more that could be said on that topic. Perhaps i got time for one more question. Who's got a burning question tonight? Go ahead. I like your questions. Well, that's a great question. I'll, I'll summarize the question for those listening online. Um, basically, once you're saved, God saves your soul, are you saved eternally? And can you sell your soul to the devil? Could a Christian do that? Um, well, let me just say this. I sold my soul to the devil um, in, a, in a very... I actually was reading the Satanic Bible, and I was uh, wanting to become a Satanist, so I sold my soul to the devil. But as I, then I got later on in the Satanic Bible where it said you don't even have to sell your soul to the devil. I just thought that was kind of ironic. But that being said... Um, for, I was never a Christian either, so I guess there were, that, that's not part of your question. When we become Christians, God writes our names in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I don't care uh, you know, if you're the most mature Christian or the least mature Christian. You put your faith in Jesus and your name's in the book. Amen? Whether your name stays in that book or not 
isn't determined based on, you know, I did a few good deeds or I did a few bad deeds. You know, it's not based on, you know, how good you've been and how bad you've been. It really has to do with did you stay connected with Jesus in your life? Did you allow him to, to, to perfect your Christian character? So what happens is you come to the end of your life, whether that's a young person or an old person, and God takes, you know, if you, let's say you die, God takes the book and he judges you based on your, whether you were a Christian. He judges you based on your relationship with him. It's not based on, oh, wow, he, you know, he did 99% good things and he only did one bad thing, so you know, it's in his favor. That's not how judgment works. Right, judgment works. And was he confessing his sins? Was he repenting of his sins? Was he, um, you know, praying and spending time with Jesus? Was there a relationship there? Was he a Christian? So whether we're a Christian isn't dependent upon, you know, like like today I I'm a good Christian and then tonight, you know, I go and sin and oh I'm off the books, you know, and then I'm back on the books because I repent and then I'm back off the books, you know. That's not how it is. God judges us based on our character. Have we let God transform us into the Christians He wants us to be? And that judgment takes place at, you know, at the end of our life or for those who are alive when Jesus comes, you know, you'll be actually be alive when that judgment happens. So uh, in essence, uh, yes, a person, well, let me phrase this. You can't sell something that you don't own. God, you, we all belong to God, right? And so you can't sell your soul to the devil just because of the fact that, you know, you know, you can give your life to the devil and, and hope you don't, but you could. And uh, Satan you know, certainly would want you to do that. Uh, but Jesus bought you. You belong to him. And if we want to remain his forever, we've got to renounce the world. We've got to turn from our sinful ways. We've got to come to Jesus and let him deliver us, put our faith in him. Um, so, but really the essence of your question, I think is, you know, is the teaching of once saved, always saved, a true teaching. And I could spend a whole hour talking about that. There's so many scriptures that mention that. But uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 is one I'll read here that I think is, bears enough warning for us and really answers the question uh, just sufficiently. Um, 2 Peter uh, chap chapter 2, rather, it says this, beginning in verse 20, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they were again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to the wallowing in the mire. Yes, a person has a freedom of choice. And they have the freedom to choose Jesus and they have the freedom to reject Jesus. And when we come to Christ and we become His, He doesn't handcuff us to heaven. He won't, and we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. He doesn't force anybody into heaven. Um, he didn't force Satan to stay, Lucifer. He didn't force him to stay in heaven. He didn't force Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree of life, or tree of knowledge of good and evil, rather. And in the same way, God does not force you and me uh, to maintain a relationship that we don't want. By God's grace, he gives us every reason to do that, and we should want that, but he doesn't force it. Hope that helps answer that question. Um, I'll tell you what, right now, I think, uh, Elder Bob, are you going to have an opening prayer and a welcome? Uh, this is another uh, elder of this local church here, and he's been gracious enough to uh, lead us out today with a prayer. And it's a pleasure to stand on this side of you. I've spent most of the series back there, so I've seen the backs of your heads. You have some lovely backs of the heads, but you have beautiful smiles too. Uh, and also, if you're enjoying this series as much as I am, we invite you to continue to study the Bible with us after this. I actually lead a Friday night Bible study, which we put on hold for these meetings, and it was well worth us putting that on hold. Uh, we just finished Revelation, believe it or not. Before that, we did Daniel and the Sanctuary. The next one we're debating. We've got a couple of different topics we're looking at. One I'm looking at is uh, it's a book called The Faith of Jesus, which I think would be great follow-up for this, you know, why do we believe what we believe? And it gets into, into how all of that is centered on Jesus. So we invite you to consider joining us for that. But uh, for now, I know uh, Pastor Wyatt has a hot topic for us tonight. So let's uh, bow our heads for a little prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful series we've been having. We thank you for blessing us uh, with Pastor Wyatt and, and for bringing us your truth. We ask you to send your spirit to descend upon us, Lord, and give us 
wisdom and understanding as we study your word. We thank you for asking these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> there is a name that is so precious, a name. Thank you. 
Reminds me of the book of Acts chapter 4, verse 12. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That name of Jesus. And I left my Bible. A preacher without the Bible is like a soldier without a sword. <sighs> no good. <laughs> so, praise the Lord. Um, we have two presentations this evening. Uh, after this one, we're going to be studying at 7.30, uh, Revela sorry, A Desolate Planet. That's our topic. A desolate. But we're going to look at a thousand years. Uh, my sermon won't take a thousand years, hopefully, but it will uh, cover the period in Revelation chapter 20 that uh, explains what's going to happen after Jesus comes. And then uh, Sunday, let me get my clicker working here. Let's see. Let's try this. There you go. Sunday will be the mark of the beast uh, at 5.30. And then we are going to have a 7.30 presentation, Return of the Woman. There it is. Return of the Woman. We're Revelation chapter 12. So we're going to look at Revelation 13 and 14 deals with the mark of the beast. Revelation chapter 12 deals with this woman and this group of people who actually don't get the mark of the beast. And it also deals a little bit in Revelation chapter 14 as well. And, and there's actually... I just want you to know, I am actually cutting short this series. I'm leaving some topics out that I want to study with you. I just There's just only so much time we have. And, and uh, anyway, like Jesus said, many things I have to tell you, I just cannot tell you now. Um, but uh, perhaps in time, perhaps in the future studies, we'd be able to cover uh, some other things. Uh, then Tuesday, the testimony of Jesus. Again, we're going to look at Revelation chapter, uh, in this case, chapter 12 and chapter 19. Um, and we're going to look at this... Uh, uh, this topic about uh, something called, uh, well, the spirit of prophecy, Revelation 19 and verse 10 talks about. And then on Wednesday, this is going to be a challenging message. Uh, this is one that you really need to uh, maybe go shopping for this week and buy some uh, of those um, uh, you know, steel toe boots because you probably have your toes stepped on a little bit more. Well, remember this morning we stepped on a couple toes, right? I think I stepped on my own a little bit. But this, uh, this message here is really going to challenge us. And then on Friday, we get to finish and wrap up the series with a message called For Freedom. And I'm going to share my personal story of how I became a Christian. I'll also say that, and I, I shared it this morning, I forgot to put the slides in this presentation here, but uh, maybe for the next hour. But uh, following Saturday night, we're going to have a presentation at the Warren Performing Arts Center, and I hope you can plan on attending that as well. I want to mention that um, some of you, several of you actually, indicated a desire for baptism, that you would like to re either give your life to Jesus in baptism because you've never been baptized, or because you want to uh, rededicate your life to Jesus through baptism. Well, if you want to do that, uh, we're actually going to make several opportunities for you to be baptized. If you believe that you'll be ready by this coming Saturday evening, or Saturday morning, sorry, that's next week, Saturday, um, we'll actually have a baptism uh, that on the 21st. If there's anybody ready for that, we'll be ready for you. And then on May 28th, the following Saturday, uh, we actually, I think we're going to have some baptisms over at the Warren Performing Arts Center um, with uh, the other meetings that are going to be going on. So if that's when you would like to have uh, celebrate a baptism, you know, maybe give you some, give, give you an extra week to prepare. And uh, anyway, that'd be good. And then we actually, on June 18th, we're going to be having a camp meeting up in Cicero, I know it's a good distance, but I'm telling you what, we're going to have, it's going to be a whole week of revival, and uh, but on that Saturday, I believe we're going to be having some baptisms. And don't quote me on that. I haven't got official permission uh, for this, but I'm pretty sure uh, we can make that happen. So if that'll give you some time to get ready uh, for your baptism, by all means, uh, let me know. And, see, and please, I do encourage you, please pull me aside and say, I'd like to prepare for these times. What can I do to be ready? Uh, speaking of that, if anybody is interested, this Thursday, which is an off night, uh, I will hold a, a, what I call a baptismal class. And that's not just for baptism. If anybody who's just interested in, in learning what it means to, to you know, rededicate their life to the Lord, um, you know, through some basic Christian doctrines, we'll, we'll gonna, we're going to do that this coming Thursday at uh, well, 7 o'clock probably. So plan on that if, uh, if you have that interest. All right, guys, we've got to get into the presentation. I've got a lot to share, and then we're going to break, we're going to eat, and then we're going to come on back here, and I'm going to share some more, okay? So right now, I'll invite you to say our motto with me. If it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it's not, I don't need it. Now, these two topics I'm about to share about actually go together quite well. Uh, the topic of hell and the 
topic of the millennium. So that's why we're going to do them in the same evening. Uh, that being said, my next presentation probably will not be as long as this one. So if you're thinking, oh, no, he talked a long time for that one. Um, this next uh, presentation is actually going to be a little bit shorter than this one after we come back from our food. If you're watching, it's not too late to come on out here. We would love to have you sitting in the seats. All right. Would you bow your heads with me uh, as we pray to the Lord? Heavenly Father, uh, this topic of hell is a very uh, serious topic. And it's also a topic that I know really breaks your heart that there will be some that will be lost and will end up being cast into the lake of fire. So Lord, as I present this evening, help me to represent you and your character um, the way that you would have so that, Father, we would believe and understand the truth and that we would walk in the truth. Uh, give me the words to speak tonight, Father, in Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. You'll see at the end of this presentation why I call it God's Strange Act as we look at these hot facts about hell. Now, I told you, uh, coming leading up into this meeting, that I would give you uh, a few answers. I promised I would give you, so, uh, tell you exactly where hell is. I would tell you the temperature of hell. I, I even told you, I would tell you the population of hell. So uh, that being said, I have discovered the location of hell. And uh, I want you guys to know that it's actually not that far away. It just It's just about a four-hour drive from here. Uh, you can actually probably get there quicker if you drive over the speed limit, um, which if you're going to hell, you, you know, what's the difference, right? Might as well drive over the speed limit. But literally, hell, Michigan. Hell, Michigan is, is a real place, and it's just northwest uh, there of Ann Arbor, Michigan. And so uh, it's, you know, if you guys wanted to go visit, you certainly could do that. Um, hell, Michigan. Now, can you imagine what the population of hell, Michigan would be? 666 people. Um, it is, but they have calculated a total of about 72 people. So it's a very small township. Um, 72 people in hell right now. Uh, and then I actually did a little uh, about a couple hours ago. I checked the weather in hell, and turns out the temperature in hell is a nice 67 degrees. Well, that's a comfortable sounding hell, doesn't it? And uh, now I now I've presented this during the winter, and I'll tell you what. Sometimes hell freezes over. I've actually seen it happen and uh, been able to share that. But then again, uh, it is Michigan, so it doesn't get too hot in that hell. Now, I share these, these thoughts with you, and, uh, but you know, I believe I can actually answer several of these questions about the genuine hell from the Bible. I will talk about the population of hell tonight. I'll talk about the location of hell tonight. I'll talk about when hell burns. But you know, before I really get into this topic, I just want to kind of lay a a foundation of what some popular teachings are about hell. And it's actually fairly sad as you see what some preachers have said. Now, let me tell you, you've probably all heard a fire and brimstone sermon, haven't you? You've heard hell preach so hot. And, you know, and what, what's the intention? What's the design? What's the purpose of a lot of these ministers who share uh, these fire and brimstone sermons? Well, the desire is to get people to say, wake up! You're a sinner. You're going to burn in hell. You better repent right now. And you know what? It actually is pretty effective. A lot of people get so scared about hell that they say, I want to give my life to Jesus. Now, I will tell you this. I'm just going to mention this point. God doesn't want us to be scared of him. But there is a biblical principle of the fear of the Lord. And there is a difference. Fear is a respect because you know that there will be consequences. But being scared of God is quite a bit different. God isn't trying to scare anybody, and He doesn't teach hell in the Bible as, as a way to uh, cause people to be scared right into heaven. You know, you've heard of, um, well, let's just listen to some of these sermons that were preached. And this one here, you've probably heard of Jonathan Edwards. Uh, he wrote a, a sermon. In fact, he, back in the day, he used to write out their sermons. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Here's the view, as my audio is going in and out, let me check my thing here. It says, the view of the wicked being tormented in hell will be a font of happiness for the saints throughout eternity. Even more. Did it die? The batteries die? Okay, there we go. Is it coming through the audio? Is it dropping the audio on the, okay. 
Well, maybe I get another mic. I can hold a microphone, I guess, if I need to. More precious to them. So let me back up, guys. I want to make sure we get the concept here because this is a teaching that a lot of Christians used to uh, believe. In fact, when it, whenever Jonathan Edwards, this is back during a time of great, um, oh, what do you call it? It's uh, uh, um, this, this revival that took place in the early 1800s, late 1700s. Whenever he would preach, they would actually have great revival. People would, uh, you know, bring taverns into, into churches and, and it, was, you know, it was quite the, uh, the fanfare whenever it would come down. Bring it up here. I'll, I'll use that. I'll turn this off here. That's all right. All right. Uh, concept or another, uh, you can call it a theory, about hell. This one I'm going to pull from the Bible, and as I do this, I, I just want to challenge you to be open-minded, and I want you to think um, whether or not this holds more biblical weight than another teaching. Now, I'm going to start off by sharing what I believe about God. I believe that God's personality is love, and I also believe God doesn't change. I believe that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I also believe that Satan wants you to believe that God is a tyrant. Satan wants you to believe that God is unfair. Satan wants you to believe that, that, that God is like he is. That makes sense, right? Because he's a deceiver. That's what he wants you to believe. But the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, it says, God is what? Love. God is love. So, and in this study today, I want you to let that principle of God being love kind of undergird this topic. As we look at two concepts about hell, two popular concepts about hell, unending torment or that. I'm not sure what that is. There it is. All right. Let's see, make sure my computer's charging. Okay. And then also... Complete destruction. So you have uh, two basic teachings. By the way, the teaching of complete destruction is really catching on today. I mean, the most 
not I wouldn't say most, it's still in a minority, but there's a lot of Christians today who are just simply saying, wait a minute, why are we believing that the wicked are going to burn eternally when the Bible says this, 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 and this? And so Christians in, in the droves are rethinking the topic of hell and letting the Bible speak, and they're actually coming to a different conclusion. And that being said, what I want to do tonight is give a, just a, a Bible study on this topic, and may we continue to uh, be able to learn and grow and come to biblical conclusions without letting our prejudices or teachings or traditions affect us, okay? Now, in the Bible, hell is used 54 times. This is the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, in the Old Testament, every time the word hell is translated, it's always translated from the Hebrew word sheol. And in the Greek language, a lot of the times was from the Greek word Hades. And in both the time, anytime you see Sheol and anytime you see Hades, it is very simple. It just means grave. So Hades means what? Grave. Sheol means what? Grave. And I'll tell you, this is this is across the board, just factual information, concordances and, and lexicons, everything bears this out. It just means the grave. Now, look at some examples. Job 17, 13. Job says, if I wait, the grave is my house. And again, that's the word Sheol, is my house. I have made my bed in the darkness. Psalm 16, 10, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Now, this passage is actually the word Sheol. So this is a prophecy concerning Jesus Christ. And it says that he would not, God would not leave his soul. And remember, we learned what a soul is. A soul is a person, a being, a living being. He said he would not leave that person in hell, neither would thou suffer the Holy One to see corruption. That word hell usually conjures to our mind the fiery burning place. But that's not in this case. In fact, we're going to see this again in the New Testament, Acts 2, verse 27, as it quotes that in Psalms, it says, because that will not leave my soul in hell. And again, this time it's Hades. Hades, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. And so Hades in the New Testament, Sheol in the Old Testament, simply means grave. This prophecy is not about Jesus going to a place of burning. It's about Jesus going to the grave. Unfortunately, when we see the word hell, something else comes up in our mind. I'll explain why in just a minute. Here's another example of Hades. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? You see, all the righteous people go to hell because hell just means grave. Uh, see that? Every, did Jesus go to hell? Because it means grave. Because everybody who dies goes to the grave. Everybody goes to Sheol. Everybody goes to Hades. Unfortunately, it translates it as hell. Now, there are, this is why you have to understand a little bit of Greek to understand this topic well, okay? There are several times in the New Testament, 12 times in fact, where Jesus and uh, the writers use the word Gehenna and it's translated as hell. So in these cases, when you read the word hell, it does mean the fiery burning place. Otherwise, see, if, if all you're reading is the word hell, then how do you know the difference? So I'm so thankful to modern translations for actually bearing this out and actually transliterating, in many cases, Hades, so you know that it's not talking about Sheol, or, or sorry, it's not talking about Gehenna, the grave. Now, Gehenna, just as a clear, by the way, I've been, um, I've been to hell on, on, a per, on a personal level. When I was in Israel, you actually, you go through this valley. If you're, if you're leaving Jerusalem, you actually drive through this valley, and this valley is called the Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom is where, back in Jesus' day, was a place where they had basically a garbage dump, and they would have this constantly burning fire where they would, they would throw you know, garbage and junk and sometimes even uh, like human bodies that were uh, you know, the poor, they couldn't afford to bury, they'd just throw them in there. And so Jesus uses this word Gehenna, which basically means the Valley of Hinnom, as a symbol of hell. So I've been there. I've been to the place where hell was. Now, of course, Jesus is using that as a symbol of the future hell that will burn. You understand I haven't been to that place. I don't plan on going. hope you don't either. So that place of burning is Gehenna in the Greek. Here's an example of that, Matthew 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body where? In hell. Now, this is accurately translated because this is Gehenna. Hell is Gehenna. Now, why do we have the different terms, hell? Well, because back in 1611, when the King James Version was translated, 
um, th basically hell meant something else. Hell just meant uh, to cover or to hide. It actually has that German origin, which just means to cover or to hide. Uh, in fact, when I was overseas, I came across uh, these fields. You may know what these fields are, uh, what they're planting in these fields. Let me look up a little closer. Do you may recognize what they're planting in there? What would that would be? No, those would be potatoes. That is a potato field. And you know what they call this? You see how they're kind of got these hills in those the, the potato fields? That's because that's how they plant the potatoes. They call it helling potatoes. Helling, because it's the hill, and that's the old word they would use for that. Helling potatoes. And so that's what, basically, it just meant burying something. So hell, in the 16th century, 17th century mind, just meant the grave most of the time. And, of course, you got Gehenna also, so there's that meaning kind of transition there. So I'm going to ask a few questions tonight, and we're going to answer those questions together. When will hellfire burn? Where will hellfire burn? How long will hellfire burn? And why will hellfire burn? Now, why do I say hellfire? It's just to clarify, we're not talking about hell grave. We're talking hellfire. See the difference? So let's begin with the first one. When will hellfire burn? Well, the Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of when? Judgment to be punished. The day of judgment. The wicked will not be punished until when? The day of judgment. Until then, they are what? They are reserved. They are reserved. You know, when you, I don't know, what, what's the fanciest restaurant in all of Indianapolis? The Olive Garden, that's the fanciest one out there? Okay. I, I think we're all on a budget in this room, and uh, that's about as fancy as it gets for those on a budget. So let's just say we call up Olive Garden and, and say, you know what, reserve a spot for me tomorrow night at 6 o'clock. We're going to have dinner there. Now, of course, we're not because we're going to be here tomorrow at 6, but you get the idea. And until I'm there, it's reserved for me. I'm not there until I show up. And so in the same way, hell will not burn until when? Until the day of judgment in this case. Now, we're going, to we're going to look at this more in detail in our next presentation, but in the Bible, there's two resurrections. There's a resurrection of life, and there's a resurrection of damnation, right? Jesus made this clear in Matthew 5, 28 and 29. He said, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. So until, until Jesus comes back, until he raises them up, they're in their graves, and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation or condemnation, says the New King James Version. Okay, So there's two resurrections. The first resurrection uh, happens before the thousand years. The second resurrection happens after the thousand years. Again, my next presentation, we'll talk about that in detail. Here it says in Revelation 20, verse 5, the rest of the dead live not again to the thousand years were finished. So the wicked don't come up in their resurrection till after the thousand years. And after they come up in the resurrection, after the thousand years, Revelation 20, verse 9 says, they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. So here the wicked are now surrounding the new Jerusalem. And what's the Bible say in verse 9? Fire came down from God out of heaven and did what? devour them. This fire that comes down, that, make, that makes the lake of fire, this happens when? After the thousand years is over. Okay, let me go back to that just real quick here, right there, till the thousand years were finished. So it wasn't until after the thousand years that hellfire will burn. So understand, hell is the complete destruction of the wicked at the end of time. So what do we have? Hellfire is going to burn when? At the end of the world, the day of judgment. They're going to be burned up after the resurrection of the damnation. And let me make this clear right now. Whether you're saved or you're lost, whether you're born again, or whether you're, whether you're you know, wicked, everybody goes to the grave when they die. Okay? That means nobody right now, nobody is burning in hell. Uh and then you just point out after the wicked surround the New Jerusalem. Here it is. How many are burning in hell tonight? Zero people. The population of hell, <laughs> see, I told you I'd tell you the population of hell tonight. You didn't know I knew this, is zero because hell isn't burning yet. Hell is yet in the future. It's a fire that will burn at the end of time. Now, where is the hellfire going to burn? That's a good question. We're going to answer Revelation 21, verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with what? Fire and brimstone. 
which is the second death. This lake which burns with fire and brimstone is called in the Bible the second death. Now, does the Bible tell us where the wicked will be when they're resurrected and punished by the second death? Where will the wicked be? We don't have to guess about this one either because it says in Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 and 8, it says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of what? The earth. Again, more about this in the next topic, but look at this. Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of what again? The earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about, the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Now, do you understand here that, I mean, oh, please understand this. It's not in some primordial place in the earth. It's not somewhere out in the, in, in the far reaches of the universe, but it's going to be on the earth that the fire is going to come down and consume the wicked. Proverbs confirms this. It says, if the righteous will be recompensed or repaid on the earth, how much more the ungodly and the sinner? The Bible says the meek shall inherit the earth, right? Well, the wicked are going to get their punishment also on this earth. But, but is that what you've heard? Is that what you knew? I remember as a little boy, um, we were in the back. This is in Dixon, Missouri, a uh, little, little bitty town. And uh, we, my mom uh, got a house there. My mom and dad had already been divorced at this time. I think I was about uh, four or five years old. And I remember we were, we were there, and we were di – was, were they divorced yet? I'm not even sure they were. Anyway, point is, I remember my brother and, and I were in the backyard digging holes. And we dug down so, so deep. But for some reason, you know, because you, know, you said, you know, you can dig to China if you dig deep enough. And we were, I mean, I'm sure we were almost to China, but we were so deep that we thought it was getting warm. We thought it was hot down there. And you know what we thought? Because we thought that, the, that we were getting close to hell. Hell was somewhere in the middle of the earth. And I don't know why we believe this. I mean, I, I don't know if parents told us this or what, but we used to believe these kind of ideas and uh, the hell was in the middle of the earth. You ever, you ever believe that? In fact, there's a story told, I don't know if you heard about this, this, uh, this tabloid magazine came out and, and, and shared. I remember hearing, in fact, I'll tell you how I heard, first heard about this. Has anybody ever heard of Art Bell? Uh, you know, you know uh, was it Coast to Coast, Late Night Radio? Anyway, this guy, he had a guy, he, he, he talks about extraterrestrials and just kind of all this far out stuff, conspiracy theories. Well, anyway, I'm listening to this on the radio one time, and he's got a guy on there. He says, listen, I've got an exclusive audio tape you've got to hear. I'm going to play it during the video or during this radio interview. And so, of course, they played it up for a while. Finally, they played this audio tape. And you know what it was? It was this right here. We drilled through the gates of hell, and he was playing the audio. Apparently, they, they, they were drilling so deep down in the earth, 14.4 kilometers deep, and then they lowered a microphone down so low that they can listen to what was down there. And sure enough, they heard the screams of the damned. They heard the, the, uh, you know, the, 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 all the wicked down there writhing in pain. And I got to listen to it. I'm like, well, what is that? I listen really closely. You know, and it does sound, kind of sound like people in agony. And I thought, wow, they found hell. Of course, I would not trust a tabloid magazine over the Bible, and even audio uh, proof and evidence is not strong enough evidence for me. See, I'm from the show-me state, Missouri, and I demand a little stronger evidence. I want to see it in the Bible. Friends, hell is not a hot spot in the center of the earth. But I did think, though, when I first started studying this out, I thought, well, you know what? It kind of makes sense if hell's in the middle of the earth, because it doesn't, don't the scientists tell us that the, the, the core of the earth is like, you know, uh, a magma and, and hot and, you know, it's just, it's intense and on fire. But then I, they say that, and then I, you ever go visit a cave and the lower you go, the colder it gets. And I'm like, wow. It just doesn't make sense to me. But anyway, I don't know. It, it, there is some lo lava comes from underneath, so I know it's got to be hot down there at some point. But here's the thing, friends. I need to look at the Bible with open eyes and say, God, what does your word say? And what I find is that hell is going to burn right here on earth. Right here on earth. Now, with that said, we're going to ask the next question. Now, this question is probably the most pertinent of the evening, and that is how long will hellfire burn? We know it's going to burn at the end of the world. We know the hellfire is going to burn right here on this earth. But when hellfire starts burning, how long will it burn? Well, we don't have to guess on this subject either. In fact, I would say the Bible is more clear on this topic than on most topics in the Bible. 
Go back to the story of the Sodom and Gomorrah. Go back to the story of when God told, told um, uh, Abraham, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah with what? Fire and brimstone. And why was he going to do it? Because of their wickedness, right? And so here's what it says in Jude 1.7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So Sodom and Gomorrah, they were burnt to a crisp. They received fire and brimstone. And that's the same language the book of Revelation uses. In fact, I believe when we read about fire and brimstone in Revelation, it's, he writes these with terminology that's designed to make us go back to the Old Testament and find out where these symbols are used. And so fire and brimstone, it's not a symbol, fire and brimstone is a literal thing that happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. And so here it says that they suffered vengeance of what kind of fire? Eternal fire. Sodom and Gomorrah were burned up with what? Eternal fire. So they become an example of eternal destruction that happens at the end. But here's a question for you. Is Sodom and Gomorrah still burning today? Now, again, I tell you, I've, I, I had the privilege of traveling through Israel, and I looked for Sodom, and I looked for Gomorrah, and I happened to find the, 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 the old ruins of the city of Gomorrah, and guess what? Nope, it's not on fire. It is not on fire anymore. In fact, here's what it says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. And I'm going to play a video here in just a second, so you might make sure the volume's turned up. But it says, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow. Turned Sodom and Gomorrah into what? Into ashes. What does that mean? That means that they were completely destroyed. And then it says what, the, what Jude also said is making them an example unto those that should after live ungodly. So what does it mean burned up with eternal fire? Does it mean the fire burns eternally? No, it means the results are eternal, irreversible. When you turn something to ashes, you're not bringing it back. In fact, the only one who can bring something back from ashes is God. And God doesn't say he's going to bring the wicked back from ashes or Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, if you go travel throughout Sodom and Gomorrah today, you can actually find thousands upon thousands of these sulfur balls, okay? These sulfur balls are, are actually, this, I believe, what the Bible talks about, brimstone. And I just so happen to have one right here. And you can, maybe if you want to check it out later, I'll open this, I'll send this little baggie here. I'll open this up later, you smell it, and it smells like sulfur. This is biblical brimstone, Brimstone is sulfur, and that's what would fall down as these balls of fire. This is what burns Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes. And you go over there today, and you find just so much ashes all through the area. So I'm going to play this video now. Hopefully the audio is going to work. The Bible says the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed with everlasting fire. Now, as you can see, the everlasting fire did its job by turning everything into ash. Here is what possibly very, could very well be either Sodom and Gomorrah or one of the five cities that were destroyed by this ash all around. The Bible is true, and you can know it. Amen. That was a few years back. But I'll tell you something. The, um, what I discovered over there, by the way, it turned out later that this was Gomorrah there, not too far from Masada, where that's at, and right there by the Dead Sea. But what, what I discovered is, is that God, when he says he's going to do something, he does it. And he was going to turn it to ashes. And that's exactly how it describes the lake of fire. That's, that's what it describes as the, uh, the fire and brimstone in the last days. So understand when the Bible says eternal fire, it's eternal in effect, not eternal in duration. And this is the, how the rest of the Bible describes the length and duration of hell. In Malachi chapter 4, verse 1, it says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yea, who, all who do wickedly, will be stubble. And the day is coming, which shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. It says it will burn them up. That's the language of hellfire. The wicked will not be tortured eternally, but rather they will be burned up. Malachi 4 verse 3 says the same thing about the wicked as it does upon Sodom and Gomorrah. It says, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. Here again, again, I'm, I, I could, I'm not even going to share with you a, but a portion of the verses that make this so abundantly clear. Psalm 37, 9 through 11, for evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Chew on that thought. 
God says the wicked are not going to be in existence. Very clear. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. A few verses later in verse 20, it says, The wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadows, shall vanish into smoke. They shall vanish away. The smoke, poof, they're gone. Obadiah 16, they shall be as though they had never been. God is going to get rid of sin, of sinners, and of course, Satan. In fact, get this now, I want you to really pay attention to this. Satan himself, but first of all, is that what the devil looks like? You think the devil's got a pitchfork and some horns? You've got some leotards and, uh, and the, uh, a pointy tail? You think that's the devil? You think he's got all that? Let me tell you something. The devil wants you to make, th- make you think he's a cartoon. The devil wants to make you think he's all silly. Like, no, the devil was a beautiful angel. And he's a lot more tricky than this right now. I mean, right, looks like this. But you know, a lot of people think that the devil is in charge of hell. And I don't know, Hollywood certainly has made this out to be. Have you, I've watched countless Hollywood movies growing up. I mean, I watched every movie you can possibly imagine. And every case you have the devil, uh, remember, uh, if, if you haven't watched these things, I hope you don't ever go watch them, but like Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure and stuff like that. They went down to a subterranean place in the earth. Like, like somewhere in the earth, and they find Satan. And guess what Satan's doing down there? He's torturing the wicked. He's torturing the lost. He's usually it's Hitler down there, right? Satan's torturing Hitler. And you know what, what, I, what I find fascinating is that somehow people honestly believe that Satan is on God's payroll. That God has Satan torturing the wicked. That somehow that the, the devil... Is it charged now? But what's the Bible say? What the devil is doing right now? When when he, God asked Job what the devil was doing, what's he saying? He's going around the earth, right? The Bible says the, that that uh, that Satan is like a roaring lion, roaring lion goes around the earth seeking whom he may devour. Satan isn't somewhere in the middle of this earth. Satan is on this planet, deceiving, tricking, and, and causing people to be lost. But I've read this book, and maybe anybody here ever read this book too? No, no condemnation. I read this book. 23 Minutes in Hell. Has anybody ever read that book, 23 Minutes in Hell? Nobody? Okay, I'm a little surprised. Well, 23 Minutes in Hell, this little book, uh, Bill Weiss, I think the guy's name who wrote it. This guy, I remember reading this book, and he tells the story about how he went to hell for 23 minutes. And he says, I wasn't a dream. He said, he didn't die. It wasn't like a near-death experience. He said, God took him to hell so he could experience it, so he could warn people. And so he went down to this hell, and he describes hell, and he, all these du- dark dungeons and, and you know, these demons, and he describes these demons that look so hideous, worse than this guy here on the screen. I mean, he, he described, he eventually saw the devil and all these, it just he went in detail describing all of it, which he kind of contradicted himself, because in one place he says it was so dark you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. But then he gives all these details. I'm like, how do you even see these details if you couldn't even see his hand? But anyway, um, but he describes how the demons were down there torturing the wicked. And he said, after he comes up after 23 minutes, he's like, and listen, this is a lesson for you. Don't go to hell. Repent. Turn to Jesus. And I'm thinking, wow, this is exactly what the devil wants. The devil wants to have you think that the devil's busy down in hell torturing folks. But what's the Bible really say about Satan? Watch this, guys. This is from Ezekiel 28, 18. It says, therefore, will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. According to the Bible, Satan is going to be tortured himself until he's finally burned to a crisp. He's going to be put put out into ashes. He'll be completely devoured. And then it goes on in verse 19 to say, never shalt thou be any more. Now, I like that verse. I like the idea of no more devil. And throughout eternity, there's not going to be Satan. He's not going to be in existence. He's, not, he's going to be done. He's going to be toast. He's going to be ashes. Now, if Satan's going to be ashes and the wicked are going to be ashes, my question is, how can you have a hell if everybody who goes to hell becomes ashes? Hell will eventually come to an end. Hell will burn up. Satan is going to be cremated. Now, Matthew 25, 41 says, Then he will also say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now remember, everlasting fire is the same thing as eternal fire. It's the results of the fire that's everlasting. It's not The fire isn't what burns forever. It's that the fire does what it does, and it lasts forever. So who 
is going to burn in the fire? The devil and his angels and those who um, follow him, right? Those on the left hand, the, in this case, the goats of Matthew 25. Those who don't help out the poor, those who don't feed the hungry, those who don't give water to the thirsty and clothe the naked. And that's, he says, those are the ones on the left hand. Now, I've shared this about the topic of uh, the duration of hell. But you might say, well, what about, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a couple of questions you might have. What about the Bible verses that says forever, that they would be burned forever? Well, there actually is. There's two Bible verses. There's only two, but there's two Bible verses in the book of Revelation that says that they would burn essentially forever. At least it sounds that way. So let's look at that here in the Bible. And uh, looking at verse Revelation 20 and verse 10, it says, they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Well, hold on now. That seems pretty clear to me. Tormented forever and ever. All right. And then the other one, Revelation 14, 11, says the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. So here you have two Bible verses that says that the torment will be how long? Forever and ever. Now that's, I tell you, however you spin it, it's not a short period of time. But here's the question I have. And I, and I, and I really want to be honest about this. First of all, we're in the book of Revelation. When we read the book of Revelation, are we reading book, a book of symbols and signs? Or are we reading a book where it literally describes most everything? It's the symbols and signs. So we have to be careful when we're reading Revelation not to read everything so literally. But not just that. The term forever and ever, we often think about forever and ever is like eternal, as long as God lives. But that's actually just not what the Bible teaches. Listen to this. There's, a, there's actually several accounts in the Bible of things that are described as forever that actually have come to an end already. It's true. Um, in the Old Testament, there was uh, basically there was slavery. But the slavery, of course, the Old Testament was different because after seven years in slavery, usually it was to pay off some kind of debt. After seven years, you were free. Seven years, you were done. Slavery was not a forever thing there. But let's just say the slave, he had it better with his master than he had you know, free. Well, he actually had the ability to talk to his master and say, hey, you know what? You really treat me well. Let me just stay in your house. Let me continue being your slave. Are you sure? Okay, I'm sure. He said, well, as a sign of a curse of slavery, you know what God did? He had him put an awl through his ear. Yeah, they, they got their ears pierced as a sign of slavery, believe it or not. But get this, friends. If they were to do that, he says he was to serve his master forever. You can read about there, Exodus 21, verse 6. So if you got your ear pierced, you were to serve your master how long? Forever. So let me ask you this question. Is he talking about eternally? <laughs> how long is forever? Until one of them dies, right? So understand, and this is, you see this so many times in the Bible, in the case of Hannah. Hannah takes Samuel to the temple and says that he would abide there forever to serve in the temple with, with Eli. And then later on in verse 28, it says, as long as he lives. So we understand serving in the temple was to be as long as he lives. He would be in service to God. So again, forever means as long as he lives. And, and specifically, as long as one can live in that situation. And you, and you already know this. I mean, I'm not telling you something you don't already know, because I tell you what, um, <laughs> Here recently, Walmart starts putting in all those self-checkouts. I can't stand self-checkout. I'm like, you know, they're not paying me. They're not giving me a discount. I, I you know, let's, let's give somebody a job, job security for somebody. I want to go. So I go stand in line. It's a little stubborn of me, I know. But I'll go stand in line. And there's maybe four or five people in front of me. I'll still go stand in line and wait. But sometimes, you know, that person that pulls in with a cart just ahead of you, and that thing is like overflowing. You know what I'm talking about? And you stand there, and then all of a sudden something malfunctions with the cash register, and, uh, and you know, and then you're just and you're thinking, "Wow, this is taking forever." Three minutes later, you're finally up to check out yourself, right? How long is forever in that search situation? <laughs> just a few minutes, right? But you say it, and why do we say it? Because we know that forever feels like a long time, but it isn't a long time. And let me tell you something: Have you ever been burned by something? Oh yeah. In fact, I was eating something the other day. It was, um, oh, what was it I was eating? I can't remember. But I remember um, uh, touching it and, it, and it burned my fingers. I'm like, mm, mm, I'm like, you know, licking my fingers to try to cool them off. And, and, it, and it just like, it felt like a, such a long time. And I knew it was just been a couple of seconds. I'm such a, such a, a weenie, you know? And I, I just, I, I think that we, on our minds, we, 
we do think that pain feels a long time. And so when Paul, or sorry, not Paul, but John here describes hell as being forever, the torment being forever, he's not using it in, in a literal sense as long as God lives. By the way, is God live forever? Absolutely. God lives as long as he lives, which is eternal. Okay, so I'm not dismissing forever means eternal in the case of God. I'm just suggesting to you that forever in the case of the torment of hell, for it to be consistent with the rest of scriptures, I can't just ignore all these Bible verses that says hell is going to burn out. I can't ignore that. Uh, one more example of uh, forever, by the way. Jonah chapter 2, verse 6. Jonah, remember how long he was in the belly of the fish? Three days and three nights. And yet here's how he describes it. I went down to the bottom of the mountains. Her earth was a, with her bars was about me forever. <laughs> and yet later on, or actually this is earlier on, he describes it. He says uh, Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Yeah, I can understand Jonah describing it as forever. It would have felt like forever to him to be, you know, in there with the, the creepy crawlies and the, you know, the little fish, with, what's the angler fish with the little light they have and, you know, the, the, the stomach acid of the, of, of the uh, just, I can't even imagine. In fact, forever is used 56 times in the Bible for things that have already come to an end. And this is why Christians are rethinking the subject of hell. This is why Christians today are really saying, you know what, is, the, is what we've always been told about hell being an eternal torment, is that actually biblical? So John Stott, he was a pretty famous evangelical Christian uh, a few years back, and, and he wrote a whole lot. But here's what he said. He says, a committed evangelical Christian, my question must be and is not, what does my heart tell me, but what does God's Word say, right? What does God's Word say? I like that. And in order to answer this question, we need to survey the biblical material afresh and open our minds, not just our hearts, to the possibility that Scripture points in the direction of annihilation. And that the doctrine of eternal conscious torture has to yield to the supreme authority of Scripture. It cannot, I think, therefore be replied that it is impossible to destroy human beings because they are immortal. For the immortality and indestructibility of the soul is a Greek and not a biblical concept. I can say more about that in just a little bit. According to what John Stott here is telling us, he says, look, we've got to stop and rethink this. In fact, I was really impressed. I, I was... Uh, uh, when I was locked up in, in prison, I, I met, um, I worked in the chapel department. I'm so thankful because they had a whole library full of books. And the chaplain was a Baptist. And he, he pastored a church, and then he also came in and chaplain during the week. And uh, he became to me like a mentor. He really, you know, taught me so many things and just educated me in so many ways. I was such a young Christian, and I'm so thankful for this man. And he was telling me, he said, look, uh, I, on the subject of hell, uh, I had to do some study. And what he did was, he, he told me that one Sunday morning, uh, a, a, man, a man walked into his church. He, that, you know, it was, it was a neighbor down the road. He actually attended uh, the Seventh-day Adventist church. But he said he walked into his church because their church got like, snowed out that Saturday. And so he visited on Sunday. And he said that his sermon that, that Sunday was, was about hell. And he preached it hot like Baptists do, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and so he said at the end of it, the, the, the brother came up to him and said, you know, I didn't agree with your sermon. Really? What was it? He said, well, he said, you know, he shared just a couple of thoughts and he said, here's my challenge for you. He said, why don't you go back and take a Bible, like an unused Bible, and read it from Genesis to Revelation all the way through and see what the Bible has to say on this topic. Every time you, it, it come, you come across the word hell or death or, or fire or brimstone or all these words, the soul, spirit, every, everything, highlight that. And then go back and review it. And then at the end of that Bible study, you and I aren't going to disagree anymore. And he took this challenge personally. So it took him a whole year to do this. But after a year, this chapel, this pastor, he did this whole study. He said, wow, after a year, I didn't have anything to disagree with. That, that in fact, that, there, that immortality was conditional and that there was an eternal conscious torture. And so like, I mean, he shared that story with me. I was pretty impressed with what he had to share. It's good to be open-minded. Just because we've always been taught something doesn't make it true. So here's a question I have, talking about uh, the immortality of the soul. Do the wicked have eternal life? Are they immortal? Are they immortal? Well, if you open your Bible to Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, the Bible will tell you that Adam and Eve, after they sinned, God told them, get out of the garden. In fact, God put some angels there, some cherubim, with a flaming sword. Why did he do that? The Bible says to keep the way of the tree of life. He says, lest they eat the fruit from the tree of life and live forever. You see, God did not want forever sinners, right? 
He wanted them, he wanted to separate the sinner from the fruit of the tree of life. Only, the, only those who are going to live eternally would have to, the right to eat from the tree of life. So when I learned this, for me, this is what actually convinced me, because I, I didn't grow up with this idea. I didn't believe this always. In fact, when I first became a Christian, I thought, wow, those wicked should burn. Burn them up, God. They deserve it, you know, and just fry them like a, you know, I, I, I really had some pretty crazy ideas. But when I, when I started studying this topic, all of a sudden my mind began to be open to this idea that the wicked will not live eternally. So Genesis 3 basically says that he didn't want them eating from the fruit of the tree of life, lest they live it, eat it and live forever. Now watch this. Ezekiel 18.4 says, The soul that sins, it shall die. God does not give eternal life to the wicked. Who does he give eternal life to? The righteous. Do we have a Bible promise about that? We do. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is eternal fire in hell, burning eternally. Is that what it says? It doesn't say that. It says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And this is why this is so important, friends, because if when you die, you go to the grave, you're asleep, you're unconscious, okay? The Bible calls hell the second death. After the fires burn you up, you're once again unconscious, this time never to be raised up again. There's no resurrection from the second death. There's no resurrection from the lake of fire. When the fire puts you down, you're down because the wages of sin is death. It's only the righteous that get eternal life. Please understand this concept. God does not give the wicked eternal life, even if it is to burn them. They don't have it. It's not their gift. Now, as for the righteous, Luke 20, 36, neither can they die anymore. Revelation 21, 8, the wicked die the second death, never to be raised again. So the wicked are, were punished in the hellfire throughout the season. If, sorry, this is a question. If the wicked are punished in the hellfire throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity, then the wicked will also have eternal life, which the Bible says is not true. Because, um, frankly, the soul is not immortal. Only the righteous get the gift of immortality. So where did this idea of eternal torment came from? I think uh, uh, John Stott referred to it or, or alluded to it a little bit earlier, but it actually originated with Satan, where this, he started this lie, you will not surely die. He has this idea of immortality of the soul, like, you know what, even if you disobey, you're not going to die. You're going to burn eternally. So Satan invented this lie to cause God to look bad. But it was really the Greeks who had this idea. Greeks who introduced this idea that, that, the, that you are immortal, that you naturally have an immortal soul. It is not a biblical concept. The teaching of eternally burning hell is designed by Satan to make God look bad. And listen, this is what atheists, many atheists do. They, 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 they look at what Christians are teaching, and they say, look, I can't be a Christian. I can't be a Christian because if I, was a, if I became a Christian, I would have to believe in a God who tortures people. In fact, some of the, uh, uh, like, uh, was it Robert Ingersoll, one of the famous atheists and, 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 and just uh, skeptics of this world, his dad was a preacher. And he told him all the time, yeah, you know what, you're going to burn in hell forever if you don't repent. And he had this, he's I can't serve a God like that. And so the army of Satan continues to grow because of people who are running from a God that doesn't exist. What do I mean by that? I heard the story of a brother was uh, was on an airplane sitting next to a man, and he's talking about God and says, you know, I can't believe in God. Why not? Well, I don't believe in a God who's going to torture people in hell for eternity. He says, I don't believe in that God either. I like that idea that the God I want to believe in is the God of the Bible. He's not portrayed as a, as a God who's, a, who, who's a, a meanie up in heaven, just, you know, who finds his greatest thrills in, in hurting people. If hellfire burned eternally, then God himself would be perpetuating sin. Think about this thought. Sin, sinners, and Satan. Hell is designed to destroy them forever. And yet, watch this. If they exist a billion years down the line, two billion years down the line, a trillion years down the line, wouldn't sin still be around? And wouldn't an eternally burning hellfire spoil the happiness of the saints? And not just that, do you think the wicked would even enjoy it in heaven or enjoy it, you know, enjoy being alive? Let me ask you this question. I'll come back to that thought in just a minute. If Revelation chapter 14 tells, that, tells us that the wicked are going to be tormented in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, okay? If the angels 
and Jesus are going to be witnessing hellfire burn, how can you have the glories of heaven be so wonderful if the hell is just burning right there? Can you hear the screams throughout eternity as well? It just The concept just doesn't work. And so certainly those in heaven, I mean, if you knew it, I'm, because I'm telling you what, I have some loved ones that passed to the grave, and I'm telling you what, they were not Christian. They, they, they rejected Jesus. They rejected truth. They had nothing to do with God. And I'm telling you, the Bible does not promise them eternal life. Now, I hate to even admit that. I hate to even think about that concept, but that's the truth. Now, I'm not trying to judge them, and I'll let God be the judge, because I don't know what happened in those last two seconds before they died. Let God be the judge of that, amen? But I'll say this. If my loved ones are lost, can I ever enjoy heaven knowing that they're being tortured? Would God be able to enjoy heaven knowing they're being tortured? So here's some, here's some questions. When will hellfire burn? At the end of the world. Where will hellfire burn? Right here on this earth. How long will hellfire burn? Until they are all burned up. Until they receive their reward. Until they've got what they deserve. And even Jesus tells a parable, Luke 12, 45. He tells this parable about the man who knew his master's will and did not, according to his will, will receive many stripes. And yet the other servant who did not know his master's will and yet did things worthy of stripes will receive few stripes. There's going to be a difference of rewards. A 12-year-old young lady, right, who rejected Jesus and said, you know what, I don't, I don't want to serve your God. I don't want to be a Christian. I want to, you know, I want to continue to, to do my thing and watch my TV movies and all these things and, and just care less about spiritual things. This 12-year-old girl is in a car accident and dies. The idea that she's going to suffer the eternal, uh, eternal torment, she's going to suffer the same as Hitler suffers, is, is ludicrous. And to think that God would somehow give her uh, this, this, this judgment, though she didn't live a lifetime of sin, now, certainly she made some bad choices at a 12-year-old, but you know, 12-year-olds make bad choices. But a 12-year-old can also be a Christian. But she's chose you know, to go the wrong way. God will hold her accountable for that. She can't be in heaven. But the, the idea that she's going to be burning and burning and burning a trillion years later, she's still burning. How much longer, God? No, it hasn't even started yet. Burning as long as God exists. That's not the biblical principle. The Bible says they receive their reward. They're judged according to their works, the Bible says. Now, my final question here is, why will hellfire burn? Why will hellfire burn? Now, this may be a most, the most important question of the evening, but to answer it, I'm going to ask another question. Why did the British have to destroy over 5 million cows? You guys have heard of bovine spongy form encephalopathy, otherwise known as mad cow disease. This resulted back, back I think it was the 1990s, I believe. There was this, this epidemic of, of mad cow disease. These cows were eating other cows, you know, cannibal cows, and they were getting this, these, these um, um, they just, you know, basically these proton, protein um, malformations, and they became, I don't know all the details of it, I'm not a scientist, but like these prions started eating away at the brain, and, and all of a sudden the brain is turning to a sponge, and they'd go in these convulsions, and, and these cows, and they were passing it on to other cows, and eventually it went from cows to humans as it became like crutzville jacob disease, and, and, and so it was, it was crazy. It was, it was like a nightmare situation, and they had to do something about it, and so uh, Britain decided they had to do something, and they decided to kill the cows. Over 5 million cows slaughtered so that the disease would stop spreading. Now, do you think they wanted to do that? Well, I mean, they, most of the cow farmers wouldn't mind doing that over time, but they want to sell the cows for money, not lose their, their, uh, their investment, right? Regardless, here's my point. God does not, God doesn't want to see anybody suffer. God doesn't want to see anybody go to the lake of fire, right? But he's got to deal with the sin problem on this planet. Satan has started an epidemic of lies. And God is going to eventually put out that epidemic. And he's going to use fire. Now, the Bible says, I take no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord. Ezekiel 18, 32. He doesn't take pleasure in this. He doesn't want any, he wants every soul to be saved. In fact, that's what it says, I think, in 2 Peter chapter 3. It says, he's not willing that any should perish, but that should all should come to repentance. Amen? Isaiah 55, 7. This is the, where I get the title of, um, no, this isn't it, actually. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. God will pardon anybody who comes to him. Isaiah 28, 21, this is where the, the sermon title comes from. It's God's strange act. For the Lord will rise up as in Mount Perizim, 
He shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. Let me tell you something about the character of God. God is love. And for a loving God to destroy the wicked, including Satan himself, is a strange thing. That is not in God's natural character. He doesn't want to destroy anything, but it's a necessity to destroy the cancer that's called sin. It's, and I'll tell you, you know, it's like, uh, let me try to illustrate this here. Um, you know, I got a, this is good. I like this. I got an idol right here. This man of sin, or this, uh, this, this metal man here, uh, head of gold, chest of You guys know this Daniel 2 image here. But I want you to picture this and use this as a symbol of sin. Some people really like sin. Oh, it makes them feel good. It may, you know, temporarily at least, right? They like their sin, and so they hold on to their sin. But Jesus knows that sin is a cancer. Sin ultimately hurts and ultimately destroys. And so God, the whole purpose and the plan of salvation is to send Jesus to deal with the consequence of holding on to our sin, but also to remove sin from us. In fact, it says in the book of Matthew, I think it's chapter 1, I think it's verse 21, if I'm not mistaken, maybe it's verse 27, verse 21 I think it is, says, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus came to save us from our sin. Are you with me? He wants to separate us from sin because one day, friends, God is going to destroy sin. Sin will burn. And your only hope is to be separate from sin when that happens. Only Jesus can do that. You can't save yourself. Only Jesus can separate that sin out of your life. Only he can, he's the master surgeon that can cut that sin off of your life so that when you're, when the sin burns, you're not going to burn with it. So he says, give me your sin. I'm like, no, no, I like it, Lord. You know, like my, my sin makes me feel good. I, I, I really enjoy it. But if I hold on to it and the day of judgment comes, what happens to me? I get burned up with my sin. Now, if this is the size of my sin, okay, that's bad enough, right? I'm going to suffer as long as it takes to destroy that sin. But I want you to picture, what if, what if my sin is the size of this organ over here? That's a lot of sin. God, it's going to take a lot more to burn up that. And so the more wicked, the more sin we have in our lives, the, perhaps the more severe consequence. I don't know. Some people think about maybe the fire is going to burn longer. Some people think maybe it's going to burn more intense. I don't know how it's going to happen. But the fires of the lake, of the lake of fire, the fires of hell, is going to destroy the sinners, and they're going to be consumed with all their sin. But God is going to do this to cleanse the earth. Cleanse the earth. But to somehow think, friends, that God is going to torture the wicked, Human, humans don't do that. Humans don't, 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 the, the worst earthly judge you can think of will not sentence somebody to be tortured reprehensibly. I, I want you to picture for a second a scenario. Let's say you got this kid. And, you know, most of you guys probably in here are parents or will be parents one day. And let's say you got a little boy and he's playing with his toys in his room. You come in, it's just a disaster. You say, son, clean up your mess. You come back in 30 minutes later, it's still a mess. And you say, look, this is the last time I'm giving you a warning. If you don't have this cleaned up, you got it coming to you. So you come back in a few minutes later, and he hasn't moved a thing. And so you say, all right, you got it now. And so you say, let's say he has 11 toys still laying out there. And so you're going to spank him for an hour for every toy he left laying out. So, you start, so 11 hours spanking for not cleaning up his toys. What parent would do that? The worst parent in the world would not do that. And what kind of what, what would you do if you found out a parent was doing something like that to a kid? What would you do? You'd report him, wouldn't you? And you should. That's just not humane. Let me tell you, the Bible says, shall mortal man be more just than God? If a human being would not do that, you think God would do that? You wouldn't do it to an animal cause an animal to suffer like that. You, I mean, you have to be a sociopath to torture in that way. Let me tell you, people paint God in that kind of light, and that's not what the Bible says. They say, well, God's a just God. He has to be fair. Well, you know what? If God's a just God and he has to be fair, then how can he sentence people to, to suffer and burn? And picture this, as long as God exists. Doesn't make sense, friends. We serve a loving, heavenly Father, one who loves us. God is not a monster. The Bible says the fires of hell will burn out. I'm not to tell you here, I'm not trying to tell you there is no lake of fire. There will be a lake of fire, and the wicked will suffer. 
But the purpose of hell is not to torture, to, to make them suffer, to make them hurt. The purpose of hell is to get rid of sin. Hebrews 2, 3, how should we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Friends, God has done everything to save us possible. If we reject it, it's because we've chosen to reject it. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not, what? doesn't say burn in hell eternally. The consequence of rejecting Jesus is perishing. But that's not what he wants. He wants you to accept him. And if you do so, if you put your faith and belief on him, it says you will have life everlasting. Nahum 1, 9 and 10 says that sin would not rise up a second time. Praise God. No more sin, no more sinners. And listen, even if, even if God let somebody slip into heaven who was a sinner, unrepentant sinner, do you think they would enjoy heaven? you think a wicked person would enjoy the paradise that God's making? The answer is no. I heard a story about um, uh, a man, he, was a, he, was a, he just loved to gamble, and he was, uh, he was traveling, and he came to this place where he found out there's an island where all it is is just gambling and parties, and he said, I, so he got his ticket, and he went out, he got on the boat, and he's, he's out there, and he went out there too long, and he, he looked around the boat, and he realized there's a bunch of kids on this boat. In fact, there's a bunch of kids singing on this boat, and what are they singing? They're singing Bible songs. He goes to the captain and says, Captain, um, I'm getting on the. I'm, I'm heading toward the island uh, uh, where we're going to have some gambling. Why do we have all the kids on the boat? He said, "Gambling." He says, "No, sir, you're on the wrong boat. This boat's heading to the island where we're having vacation Bible school." He said, "No, turn the boat around. I don't want to go to vacation Bible school. I came out to party." He said, "Sir, we're not turning around the boat for you to let all these kids, you know, lose out on the opportunity to have the fun they're going to have and and studying the Bible and singing and 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 having that, you know, Bible camp." And so. He was there, and all oh, he was so miserable. He looked around. There was no gambling. There was no roulette table. There was no poker. There was no blackjack, no, no drinking, and he was just miserable. And I'll tell you what, friends. If God would let anybody into heaven, it would just be misery for them. It would actually be like hell. So God puts them out of their misery. I have a good news as well, Revelation 21.1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Watch this, guys. And God will wipe away all their tears from their eyes, and there will be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Are you getting what this is saying? You can't have a hell in existence. When God makes all things new, hell's over. Hell's done. Hell's in the past. Why? Because there's no more suffering. There's no more crying. There's no more pain. In fact, he says he makes all things new. The former thing, well, actually, that's the next verse. Verse five. Behold, behold, he who sat on the throne, he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. Don't make God be a liar. When he says he makes all things new, he means all things new. There's not a hell somewhere out there burning somewhere in the, in the further recesses of eternity. No, friends. There's no hell at this point. He makes all things new. Heaven is going to be heaven because Jesus is there. You're there. No more death. No more sorrow. And I tell you, I look forward to that day, friends, but here's my question tonight. Where will you live for all eternity? Where will you live for all eternity? Heaven? With Jesus? Or will you be lost for all eternity? Dead for all eternity? I had a preacher come to me once. I was preaching a message like this. He comes up after the church, the church service, and he says, Pastor, he said, um, if I preach this message in my church, nobody's going to want to come to church anymore. I said, what do you mean nobody's going to want to come to church? He said, if I preach that people are just going to burn up and be gone, who's going to come to church? I said, Pastor, I, he's another pastor. He's, I said, Pastor, if, if that's the reason they're coming to church, they're coming for the wrong reason. The reason we go to church, the reason we spend time with Jesus, the reason we are Christians is because we love God. We don't need a hell to run from. All we need is a Jesus to run to. Tonight, it's your choice to, to choose Jesus. Choose life. Choose eternal life. Jesus said, if you believe in me, you will live forever. You will have everlasting life. I pray tonight you have accepted that gift. Accepted that gift because as bad, you know, hell may not be. Actually, I'll say it like this. I'm going to close with this thought. Some people preach a hot hell, but none preach a hotter than me. Because the hell is going to be so hot, it actually destroys the sinner forever. Not continues on. That, that hell that just continues on, it's not hot enough, right? 
the hell of the Bible is so hot, it destroys the sinner. But then God, the Bible says there will be no flame to sit before, no fire to warm at, the fires are going to go out. I want you to be with Jesus. Would you make that choice tonight? Remake that choice if you have to. To choose to live with Him forever. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so, so, so very much for the gift of your son, Jesus, who suffered hell on the cross for us so we don't have to. Thank you for the gift of eternal life that you give to us, not because we've done anything to deserve it, but because you love us so very much. God, we have family and friends that are on the path to hell. We love them. We know you love them even more than we do. Help us, Father, to minister to them. Help us to draw them close to Jesus. Help them to see the love that you have, that you're not some kind of terrible, torturous God, but you're a God of love that does everything to save people from sin. May we choose you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, friends, I'm going to share this with you. Helltruth.com. You can go to this website and find tons more information about this. God bless each of you. We're going to go have some, actually, let's have a quick, another prayer real quick about the, for the meal. And then we're going to go eat and we're going to rush on back here uh, in about 30 minutes. Okay. So Father in heaven, we ask for your blessing this evening on the, uh, on the time we're going to get to spend together. We bless you for providing the food. Thank you, Father, for those uh, that had prepared this food in advance so that we can enjoy this fellowship together and uh, bring us back, Lord, as we continue to study your word about the millennium. In Jesus' name, amen.